believe at five of eight. I do. Okay. I do. We'll make sure that happens. <laughs> so um, always so, wonderful to see people's faces. So um, if any of you happen to be visible, that would be that would be great. Um, so let me just say a few words, to David, to, by way of introduction. Okay. Um, so thanks everybody for coming this evening. My name is John Torpy, and with uh, Phaedra Ruddick Dunn, I'm co-chair of the PTAC uh, DEI committee. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Professor David Kerp. Mr. Kerp is professor of public policy at UC Berkeley. He's written extensively on education policy issues, including a number of books, of which one was about Union City, uh, our near neighbor. It was called Improbable Scholars, the Rebirth, Rebirth of a Great American School System and a Strategy for <coughs> America's Schools in 2013. Um, and he's a member of the National Academy of, uh, of Education and continues to work despite the claim that he's an emeritus, that is a retired professor. He's still working hard and has, in fact, a new book coming out. But uh, he's going to speak to us for about 20 minutes, after which we'll have a Q&A for the next half hour or so. Uh, I should point out that we're going to uh, have to end at 7.55 as Professor Kirk must go off to another engagement, but I want to uh, hand the floor over to him and thank him so much for coming to do this tonight. So I want to say to all of you, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've spent a fair amount of time in New Jersey, as it happens, because I wrote a book about the Mount Laurel affordable housing case back in the 90s and, and then more recently spent the better part of a year and a half in Union City. And there um, I had carte blanche to spend, to go to wherever I wanted to in this, within the school. So I, I crouched in classrooms. I talked to teachers and administrators, um, community leaders, parents, um, hung out with a very, uh, one of the most interesting politicians in the country, Brian, uh, the, the mayor of uh, the mayor of the Union City and Senator from, from, uh, from Union City. So I know, at least that community well and up well and admire what that community has done. Uh, when John gave me my marching orders, they were quite broad. Um, and um, they basically covered, they basically are focused on two topics. One of them is the particular issue of early education. The other is the broader question of school reform. And, and I want to speak quite briefly because my role here is to be useful to you. Um, and in responding to your questions, I'll, I'll be, I think I'll be far more useful. So I'm not sure whether I'm preaching, I guess I'm not preaching to the choir because it's, it surprises me um, and disheartens me, frankly, that a town with as a reputation as aggressive as Montclair should not have public pre-K. Um, in fact, you know, it, it, it disheartens is a, is a mild word uh, for me to use in that context. Um, because there is no, if the, if the question, I, I, I'll go back a step. If the question is, where, how do you fund it? I used to have a very easy answer to this question, get rid of 12th grade. Um, because all, if, it wasn't for, if it wasn't for football, there'd be no earthly reason for kids to be hanging around getting, being bored to death as seniors in high school. That's a, that's a flip comment about a more serious point, which is that the most important education that happens in a child's life happens before they get to kindergarten. Um, poor kids start out um, in kindergarten one year behind their middle-class classmates, a year, okay? And middle-class kids start out a year behind well-off classmates. Um, and that's the, and those gaps continue, those gaps persist. If kids are, if, if children are not reading by third grade, the chances that they will drop out of school increase five times, right? And having hung out in, in schools for a while, I will, I understand what that's about because third grade really is, a, is about learning how to read. Um, the materials are pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, if you get to fourth grade, you're reading books that, that you know, when I was uh, brushing up on my Spanish, I was perfectly happy to read the, the fourth grade uh, text in, in, in Spanish. It was a hundred page book um, 
decent sized type as opposed to a 40 page book with illustrations, which was the third grade material. It's a huge jump. And it's not one that you can easily make. Well, you can't get to the point of being a, 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 a reader in third grade. It's really hard unless you come to school with a, with a basic, the basic sort of capacity to, to do the work, some basic familiarity with, with language and computational skills. Um, and we have the data on the, the powerful importance of pre-K, the life, lifelong powerful importance is immense. So the, some of it comes out of New Jersey. I and mean, the studies of the Abbott school districts, the school districts that have gotten state special state funding because of court order have shown huge impact uh, carrying on through middle school uh, of early education. And there are studies all over the country um, a famous iconic study followed a small group of parents of, of children who in the 1960s went to preschool and, and those well into their 50s, um, the, they are living significantly different lives from their class, from their, their neighbors who, because of space limitations, couldn't go to preschool. They were more likely to graduate from college, uh, from high school, go to college, um, get married, stay out of trouble. Um, and, and earn about 25% more over the course of their, of their lifetimes. And now we know brand new data that those impacts affect the next generation of kids. So you really are lifting folks out of poverty because that's what that community was about into the middle class. We, we don't have that kind of long-term data from any place else. We don't have that kind of long-term data period uh, in, in research. Um, but we do have a lot of material from much larger programs um, across the country, the kind of programs that ordinary public schools would put together. Um, and it's, it's powerfully effective, and not just in terms of literacy and numeracy, it also matters a lot in terms of how kids react to each other, the social and emotional development of children, which is at least as important um, as what they learn, as what they know cognitively. And you know, all the, the, the sort of mantras of Head Start, which is really an exemplary education program, um, wait your turn, share, use your words, right? The kinds of, if only American politics would, would pay attention to those, those, those commands, we'd be a whole lot better off. That's stuff that comes out of early education. And you, if you go into a Head Start class and you watch kids serving each other at lunch, passing the, the milk bucket around, you get a feel for what it is that I'm, that I'm talking to. Um, and so a child who, who comes from a family, imagine the, the single mom who's working hard um, and comes home dead tired and like every other parent wants the best for her kid, can't afford to buy uh, a preschool program. There isn't enough space in the Head Start class. You know, her son or daughter is going to be behind the eight ball. And as I say, not impossible to catch up, but it's tough and it's unnecessary. It's absolutely unnecessary. So get rid of football, you know, get rid of, you know, the whole bunches of things. If you were to look at the budget and say, what don't we really, what do we need more than preschool? There isn't a lot. And if you actually think about the world that way, you may not get rid of football, but you may decide, you know, if you, if you can do it to raise some more money. Uh, to buy preschool. Uh, so, you know, California now has universal preschool for uh, four-year-olds and um, income-based, income-modulated uh, preschool for three-year-olds. New York City now has universal free preschool for four-year-olds and now for three-year-olds as well. Um, and, you know, if you look at the data nationally, something like 70% of kids, four-year-olds are going to preschool. So uh, I would say, you know, item number one on the agenda is preschool. And I'm happy to talk about that all day because it's really the most important message that I can convey. The brain science is there. The, the longitudinal research following these kids is there. The economic analysis that shows the economic benefits is there the, and the social benefits, you know, keeping kids out of jail when, they, when they're grown up. I, why is it that, that there's a police association uh, police and DA's association that supports whose entire mission is supporting early education because the police chiefs say, we do not want to be in the business of arresting 15 year olds. It's not how we want to spend our lives. Uh, and we look at the data. 
and we see why this is an, an important thing to do. So that's, I, and, and that by the way is, I don't know if Union City has one, I don't, Union City does not have one secret sauce. Here's a secret, there is no secret sauce. Uh, there's a lot of hard work, which I can get to momentarily, but critical to Union City's success is an extraordinarily good early education program. Uh, and I would urge those of you who are, uh, I'm preaching to the choir, but who know who the undecideds are, who know who the on the fence folks are, to organize a visit to Union City. I can talk until I'm blue in the face, but just hang out in the classroom for an hour or two and watch what goes on. The very best teaching in America is the teaching that goes on in a, in a preschool class. I was once asked when I gave a talk like this, well, you know, how are those people gonna learn about, you know, teaching, you know, they're just not, you know. And I said, you know, with respect, it's the other way around. It's the preschool teachers who are, need to be teaching the, the kindergarten and first grade teachers, which is exactly what happened in Union City. That the, the approach to learning that has worked so well there has really been imported into the in the kindergarten and first grade and sort of breaking down the, the tyranny of kids sitting in rows and the kind of rote learning that goes on. It's very much more inquiry-based, project-based, play-rooted, purposeful play-rooted learning. So I'm hoping if, if at the end of this conversation, somebody is inspired and you guys are, are leaders in the community and you've got the the moxie and the, and the connections is inspired to take this one step further. Uh, I'm perfectly happy to make the connection to, to the Union City folks. They're, they're good friends at this point. Um, you don't need it. You pick up the phone and they'd be happy to have you, but I, I'm happy to be the, uh, the, the, uh, the go-between in that, in that story. I guess I want to pause here and see what people want to say about early education and Montclair and early education and what the research shows and how you make it happen. And what does it mean to talk about quality early education? Because that's the point that I, I do need to emphasize. It's not just getting a bunch of kids in the classroom. Um, it's, you need highly trained teachers. You need small classes. You need a curriculum. You need a curriculum that really is focused on getting kids to think, not to memorize. Um, and um, you need resources for kids to learn from in those classrooms. Uh, there are really good curricula out there. And New Jersey, for, uh, they did, may not do any more, but it, it said to the Abbott School Districts, here's six curriculum, choose one. And Union City, which tends to go its own way, said, we're gonna make up our own you know, from bits and pieces of other things, and is that okay? And they did, it's very effective. But there, there are research-based curricula out there I will say this, it's fun. You know, I'd say for those folks who say, you know, why would I want to spend a half day in a preschool class? Because it will, it is fun. It's fun to see the kind of enthusiasm that three and four year olds show toward learning. Um, I think it's going to be a very eye opening part of the story. So I do want to pause there uh, and invite conversation about any aspect of early education that people want to raise. And whoever speaks first, John is going to buy them a, 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 a latte at Starbucks. He's already promised to, to, to do that. Right, John? Thank I'll, you. I'll make <laughs> you a latte in my house. <laughs> there you go. Even better deal. <laughs> Even better. Believe me. Please. Okay, just as long as it's outdoors. Um, okay. So, you know, we had talked a little bit, um, you know, before uh, some folks. Brian, there's a, hand from, there's a hand from June. Oh, let me, let okay. me talk. Yep. June? Hi, I guess my question is, how does a town like Montclair that has a Head Start program that is mostly filled with students from other districts and has a community pre-K program with a sliding scale um, do a better job reaching the kids who are gonna be most at risk, especially in the achievement gap? And it's it's not a question of not having anything for these kids, but how do we provide something even better, you know, with maybe longer hours for their parents who might work or that's going to make a bigger difference because Montclair has an achievement gap that really hasn't moved. Well, I think that's, 
you know, the achievement gap, and I guess I want to call the social gap as well, the social capital gap, you know, and the and the cultural capital gap. And part of it is this, you know, works and plays well with others gap that's that's there. How do you how do you do this? Well, um, you're smart folks. You read and you talk to people like me and say, what is it that I need to do? You go look at what it is that place like Union City, and there are other places as well. It happens to be the one that I know best what they're doing, um, and you um, bring into the story the people who've got the capacity to make the decisions to, to produce what really should be a universal, free, pre-kindergarten program for all children in the district. Now, as I heard earlier, um, it's, Montclair is a pretty wealthy town. 13% free and reduced price lunch is a very small number by the standards of places that I know something about. But as I also said earlier, middle-class kids are as far behind their well-off, well here peers. The folks who come from Saddle River, I got the name right? The folks who come from Saddle River as poor kids are from the from middle-class kids. So it's not as though this is preschool is some program that's only good for poor kids. That is absolutely not right. Mm -hmm. um, it, benefit, it, benefit, it, it will benefit poor kids most, but it's gonna benefit any child um, in Montclair. And again, I think the patchwork approach, not the way to go about this. You wanna hire regular teachers at regular salaries with regular training who, who really understand both the psychology of kids and the uh, education options that are available to kids. Um, so that's that. That ought to be the goal. Um, just as, and I fight if we get to this, and I suspect we will. The goal in terms of Montclair's graduating of students, and I don't know the graduation rate, should be 100%. And I'll explain why that isn't just fluffery. Why that matters. Um, here, the goal has got to be 100% of the kid uh, access to 100% of the kids. And if parents are reluctant to send their kids to preschool, and I don't know, some parents are reluctant, want their kids at home. Um, what Union City did is what, is what a committed Montclair educator would do. And that is go knock on doors and talk to parents, get out of the schools, bring teachers along to explain why it is that this is a good idea for their kids. Because as I, everybody, every parent wants the best for their, for their children. And every parent, if they, if they are come to understand, if they're given the kind of information they need, that will help them to understand why it is that pre-K is such an important thing. That's, you know, in Union City, you have basically 100% participation. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a community, it's a predominant Latino community, and Latino moms are notoriously unwilling to, to cut the apron strings and let their kids go off to school. But they, they realize, but that's they have realized that those kids are going to are learning a lot in early education, so they become converts to the to the to the cause. That's a windy answer, June. I hope it I hope it touches on some of what it was that you were concerned about. Any other? Um, it did, but actually, I have a follow up question to that, and that is, how do you deal with, uh, from a political perspective, the pushback you're going to get from all the current preschools? that are around in Montclair that are going to feel threatened by this? Well, again, what there's no particular reason why you can't bring those schools what, into, into a system in which those teachers are, are become fully trained and decent salaries and are, and are supported publicly. I mean, in effect, what you wind up having in many places like Union City is what amounts to a charter school system under another name. They couldn't, Union City did not have the space to educate all its kids in public schools. Some places do, some places don't. Uh, and there is the political pushback that you describe. But I also think that you can bring those, and it's a great question, but you can bring those, those educators into the fold. They didn't go into the business of running preschools to get rich. And if they did, I, I, I hope that, <laughs> <clears throat> they have become wild, mild, wildly disappointed in the interve intervening time. They went into the business of, of running a preschool because they cared about children uh, and providing you know, curricular support to those kids, figuring out ways that 
Um, the system that that the funding for those schools can be braided in the funding of, of regular schools. Um, it's all doable. And again, you've got a bunch of examples in New Jersey that show how it's happened. Now, the idea, again, I'm I'm reciting the Union City story because I spent a year and a half there, and I, so I've hung out in these schools a lot. The idea is that if you're dropped into a classroom there, you don't know whether the sign on the door says St. Ignatius Early Education Center or the By the Wee Daycare Program or the Union City Public School Early Education Center. That's the goal. Um, I don't think they're there yet, but they're a whole lot closer than they, than they were before. And I think it is fair to say that the kids, whatever, the, whatever school the kids are going to, they're getting at least a very decent, and many of them, an unbelievably good education, early education. Jennifer. Um, good evening. Can you speak to how Union City funded and continues to fund their, their pre-K program? Yeah, they're state funds um, through the Abbott through the Abbott School District uh, funding. I mean, you're, and you know that's a that's a you know New Jersey is a rich state. You spend a ton of money on educating kids, more money than almost any other state in the country, um, and you do well by doing so. So you know, I it would be my hope would be that um, your governor uh, is interested in expanding publicly funded pre K. Certainly the president uh, has proposed universal pre-K. Those are sources of money, but you cannot let money get in the way of doing the most important thing that you can do, particularly when, you know, if I compare the amount of the resources that, union, that you have in Montclair to the resources in Union, Oklahoma, where I spent a chunk of time, you're spending three times as much money as they are. Go to see their pre-K program. It's superb. So it's, it's if you decide, the decision, the question isn't how do we pay for it? How do we get the, the decision is, is this the most important thing that we could be doing right now as a school system? And if the answer is yes, then you say, okay, where are we gonna get the money? We're gonna figure out a way. We're gonna find a solution to the money. Where are we gonna get the political support? Well, there are a lot of political allies out there, um, you know, starting with, the, starting with the governor, a lot of other folks out there, a lot of educators out there, people from other school districts, what, whoever's gonna be influential. This shouldn't be a hard sell because every, you know, the folks in, in, in Montclair have little kids or they have little grandkids or they have little nieces and nephews. They get it, they understand. Yeah. Um, the governor, the, the disgraced governor of New Jersey, Rod Lagojevich, did one great thing, which was to expand pre-K in that, in that state for poor kids. And why? Because he saw what his kids were getting and he saw what poor kids weren't getting. Um, and that's been, by the way, the pattern in, often that people see for themselves how important early education is. Those of you who are parents, and you know, I am sure, found good places for your kids to go. You had the, you knew how important it was and you had the, the savvy to go find the places that made sense to you. Um, that's the kind of program, what you want for your kids. Here's my criterion for you. What you want for your kids is what every kid deserves. It doesn't have to be the, the Mercedes version of it, but it's got the Kia version is just fine, but it's gotta, it's, it's gotta be an effective, strong, effective program for those kids. Not just with respect to, to pre-K, I would argue, with respect to education generally. But start, at, start here, start here because you're worrying about the appropriately federal notes. I think it's, uh, no, maybe it was, um, one of you noted the, the, maybe it was June who noted the, the persisting achievement gap um, that exists, that has is, that is not gone away, that has not been reduced all this time. Well, um, this is the, this is a, not the only thing to do. Again, there's no magical elixir, but it's a necessary but not sufficient condition is what I would say. But I wanna, for the moment, I'm underlining the word necessary. Brian. Brian? Yes, uh, so um, just, I, I know, you, you know, the, the idea is this is so critical that we have to just find the money, but um, just kind of thinking about the way pre-K funding has been made available by the state and the Fed so far, it's very much based on 
demographics. So Montclair, because it has that 13% free and reduced uh, lunch, has always been kind of at the end of the line or late. So while, you know, the courts were ordering funds for uh, four-year-old programs and three-year-old programs in the Abbott district, Montclair is about um, over 90% funded by uh, the local tax levy. Um, and the Christie administration put in a cap that basically said, no matter what your, uh, you know, populace is willing to do, you really need to stay at less than a 2% increase in your tax levy a year. And hopefully the state money and federal money will be coming in a few years based on what's been announced by our governor and our president, but it's not here yet. So what I'm kind of thinking about, universal pre-K would be about... 450 kids, $20,000 per student if we want to keep class sizes small. Um, so about $9 million. What do you, um, what do you, what do you spend? Uh, what is the, your, your per, per pupil expenditure now for? Our uh, per pupil K to 12 is like uh, 18,000. Okay, so you're in, the, you're, in that, you're in the same okay. range. Yeah. Let me, let me turn the question around, Brian. I'm the new superintendent. I say to you, pre-K is the most important thing. Make it happen. Figure out how to make it happen. Yeah. Remove the word but from your vocabulary. Substitute the word and. Yeah. Figure out how to do it. You are, I remind you, that you may think that, that you don't have a lot of resources. You're spending, the national average is $12,000 a year. You're spending $20,000 a year. And I realize that the cost of living in New Jersey is higher than it is in large parts of the country, but not that much higher. Um, you've got a you've got a one of the rare states that has a decently paid teaching uh, right. course, etc. You've got such assets, so many assets in the state to take advantage to take advantage of. Um, so and I guess I, my question is: you go for the whole enchilada right away, which is universal pre-K for all four hundred fifty four-year-olds, uh, you know, regardless of income, or should we uh, focus on um, making sure that we're providing a quality option for all families, let's say, making a combined household income of $80,000 or less? Okay, I'm going to, so, so let me, let me just, <laughs> let me answer that briefly. I'll answer that two ways. One, well, one, it's a very important practical question, but let me, let me throw this back at you. Let's suppose you didn't have kindergarten. Or let's suppose you, you know, the superintendent said, you know, you know we, why not? Kindergarten is very expensive, smaller classes. Why shouldn't we provide kindergarten, you know, quality kindergarten for the, for the families that are earning $80,000 a year or less? High school is kind of a waste. Senior, high, senior year in high school is kind of a waste. Why don't we just make that a, a totally tuition year? Now I'm, 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 off, I, I, I'm inviting you to think differently about this and to do your best. I, it is, it's so important, the, the, the details are crucial. I get that. The politics are crucial, the money is crucial, et cetera. But you've got to start, I would argue, you start with the will. You start with saying, we need to do this. This is like the 100% graduation story. People are going to say, but, you know, or that's just, but. Um, but if you start with a but, then you're never going to get there. And if you start with a but in this case, then you're never going to get there. And the fact that, you know, you guys are hanging out here listening to me haranguing you, right? You got a preacher, you know, you got a preacher in the house from, from, from California tells me something about, you know, the, the kind of interest that can be, that can be drawn on here. Any of the PTA folks, other, other PTA folks want to, want to chime in in this conversation? I know you guys, all the people who are here obviously have done a lot of thinking about this and I know the PTA folks have, have done so. Um, John? Well, I guess I would just say that, you know, I don't know the history of why there's no public pre-K in Montclair, but the point you made about the fact that it's not just, this is not just something for poor kids, 
that there's actually, you know, a wide band of kids, of kids from certain kinds of households that would benefit from this. Because what I sense uh, in Montclair is that a lot of people can buy their way out of, you know, a public system. So that's one reason we don't have one, right? They can simply, you know, use other opportunities that some people can't afford. But, you know, if everybody understood that there's this, you know, let's say these three tiers as you describe them, um, and that, you know, your middle class kid is also going to benefit from this, it would get more traction. Now, that's just a theory, but that's sort of my guess. No, it's absolutely true. I mean, it's the, it's the argument for why integration was important, less because you'd have white kids sitting next to black kids, but because the dollars followed where the white kids were. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here, and this is, by the way, one of the reasons that I don't like the idea of an income cap, cap program, because, I mean, the, the famous line is programs for poor people are poor programs. Um, and that's because one of the definitions of being poor is you've got very little political clout. You give, you, you give middle-class families um, a, a stake you know, in the story and life will look very different. Politically, life will look very different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, then that seems to me the political challenge, but. Jane, rather than hearing, a, seeing a, 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 um, a, a chat, why don't, you, why don't you speak up? I would be happy to. I'm Jane Suswine. I was you a are. board of it. I was a board of education member when the pre-K, which had, a, we had had a public pre-K um, in Montclair um, from 1976 on. It started in two schools as a result of a DSEG order, federal DSEG order, which I think we are still under. Um, Brian, you might be able to uh, clarify that, but um, uh it started out as a magnet system in Glenfield and Bradford and was so attractive that within a sh fairly short time, every preschool, every elementary school added a pre-K program with a particular focus, whether it was international or Montessori or whatever. Every school had a focus and the pre-K adopted the same focus. Um, in the 1996, seven, the Board of Ed, I was on the Board of Ed and there was pressure from the town council to cut the, to cut the school budget or at least not increase it. And you couldn't have taken football and all of the uh, sports and extracurricular activities out of the program and made up the difference that uh, the pre-K made. So the pre-K, the pre-K first, first we charged tuition for a year, and then there was a lawsuit, which we had to give, had to stop that. So in any case, the uh, with the support of the community and the superintendent at the time, we created the Montclair Community Pre-K, thinking that in a couple of years, it would be back in the school system, which of course it wasn't. And this was 1998 was our first year. And we are now an institution in town, a uh, very, very well-respected institution in town. Um, more than half of our parents pay a hefty tuition. Um, and uh, our mission is, uh, as directed by the town council and certainly embraced by all of us. Nikki, Nikki Jones is, is um, a, a wonderful member of the board. Um, uh, our mission is to offer a program as good as was exists in the public school and open to every child in Montclair who, uh, uh, you know, given, given our capacity. Every child um, in Montclair who can pay a hefty tuition. No, no, not at all. That's what, not, not at all. Oh, that's absolutely what you're saying. Absolutely not. Absolutely okay. not. The okay. the mission is that children of any family income are are welcome, and we have a very vigorous outreach program, and um, to attract families uh, with with very low income, we strive to have a keep maintain a thirty five percent scholarship uh, ratio. And um, I think are very successful. 
So this what idea- percent, what, Just a fact question. What percent of four-year-olds are in preschool in, in Montclair? Uh, I don't know totally, but the, um, I think a fairly good percentage. Some are in home care. We have about two, Nikki, um, correct me if I'm wrong. We have about 200 students enrolled. We um, have an arrangement with the uh, special needs program at the Board of Ed, which is located in, in several of our classrooms so that some of the children are mainstream. Some of them uh, spend part of the day at the pre Okay. And the beautiful thing about the program is that families of all different incomes from all over town are together. So and Jane, would you would you say that there is that the pre-K, there is no pre-K problem in Montclair? That's what I'm hearing. That, that Montclair has solved, has pr provides a high quality pre-K program to all of its, to all of the, the, the kids who uh, should be and would like to be benefiting from that program because through this great this this great vehicle that you've created, um, and that therefore there really isn't much to be learned from let's say a Union City about how it is that one could organize such a system. I it's think only 30% 30, 30 of the uh, historically about 30% of the kindergarten, incoming kindergarten classes have come from the Montclair community pre-K. Others come from uh, uh, other, other preschools. Um, but affording them, uh, many of the preschools are just half day and, um, and they're hefty. The, uh, you know, the ones uptown yep. are, are very pricey. And the beauty of the of the Montclair community of the uh, pre K when it existed in the system is that the kids from all areas of town were together. Now we've achieved that to a great extent at the at the Montclair community pre K. We have children of all different races and income levels. But um, if it were available um, to everybody, I, I think it would be much more uh, advantageous because it's a burden. It's a burden for many parents. Yeah, I, I that's what I that's what I'm hearing. I, I'm not, you know, again, this is this is a more generic for me to get into the details of Montclair history. For me to do it would be obviously you know, a non-starter in this in this story. I leave that. That's your set of questions. But I think the, maybe the starting point question is: Okay, are we satisfied with what we are? We've done this this Herculean thing in all these years since the preschools have closed. Is that an that and is that system that we've got enough? If so, okay, let's call it a day and move on to some other issue. Or if that system isn't enough, where, you know, what is it that we could, what can we learn from places in which the pre-K um, program really works well? And I will say that working backwards, um, I've, I've just uh, finished a book, by the way, I don't talk about retiring, John, I talk about segueing. It's a, it's a much more gentle term. I suspect that Jane might appreciate this as, as, uh, as well. We segue into different, into different careers. Um, since, um, but um, I picked three districts, one of which is Union City now, but two of which, one of them is Roanoke, Virginia and Union, Oklahoma, which is a suburb of Tulsa. They're a, they're a bit bigger than than Montclair, but not enough to be significant in this in this story. And what makes them interesting, and they are much more much more heavily much more heterogeneous than Montclair is is now. These are places where you've got between forty and seventy percent of the kids on free and reduced price lunch, and where you've got a polyglot student body. Um, uh, you know, fifty different languages in Union, Oklahoma. I mean, who would have imagined this to be wow. true? Um, so the grad, why did I, why did we pick these districts to look at? Well, their graduation rates are, are substantially higher than those of districts with similar demographics. And more importantly, in a lot of ways, there is little or no gap in graduation rates among all the groups by income or race. Um, and why do I say that? I, and that it seems to me also you talk about the kind of disparity that that uh, you know that exists. I, my hunch is, but you may or may not do this. If you were to 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 test kids when they come in in first grade, 
kind of basic knowledge of social skills as well as academic skills, you'd find already that there are huge gaps. Um, you know, and I, and that's however you go about addressing that problem in, in, in a way that works for Montclair, that's where the problem starts. And one of these, one of these districts have very different approaches. There's no one cookie cutter formula to do anything, but they've all figured out that they've got to invest heavily in preschool, even though, as I say, these are Roanoke, Virginia, Union, Oklahoma, they would think they died and went to heaven if they thought about an $18,000 a, a, student, a student budget. It just isn't, you know, it isn't in, in their, it isn't even, even a concept in those places. You go into the superintendent's office, there's a kitty. So if you want a cup of coffee, you put a quarter in the, in the, in the, in the jar. That's, that's, where, that's the kind of place we're talking about. And it works. And I do want to say a word about why 100% graduation goal, which these districts all have. I was incredibly suspicious of this. I thought every, surely every district is going to talk about, yeah, graduate every student. But in fact, if you take it seriously, then you look at what you look at the graduation overall rate and the gaps in graduation rate. And to me, graduation, I don't care about test scores. Nobody is going to ask you out in the world, what was your test score? How did you do on the New Jersey state test? Who cares? The question is, did you, gra did you get a high school degree? That's where the payoff begins, right? The, the difference in terms of lifetime experience between the high school grad and the high school dropout is huge. I mean, this carries on to college as well, but in terms of what Montclair can, can do. And so what are those, if you take seriously the idea that you've got a 100% graduation goal, then you map backwards and you try to figure out where is it along the way that problems began. And so I, I, I focused earlier on third grade, the importance of, of being able to read in third grade. And if you, if you believe that that's your goal, that 100% is your goal, then, you're, then you say, okay, we need to do whatever it takes to get these kids reading. Because if these kids aren't reading, it's just an uphill battle all the way down the road. And as distinguished from, and I'm not, this is not a Montclair story, but other places would say, oh, it's the parents, oh, it's the kids, oh, it's the whatever, you know, it's not us. But, you know, in a 100% in graduation system, it is on you. It's, it's your, it's on you to, to figure this out. The failure is not, the, is not the point. The point is you're the problem solvers in this story. And if that means bringing in social services, health services, community organizations, whatever it takes, the PTAs, whoever needs to get involved in making that happen. At each stage along the way, where, where, are the pro where do the problems arise? Kids are having difficulty in middle school math. Kids have difficulty in middle school math. What are we going to do about this? And what the answer is not, well, we'll give them another year that's even tougher, but the same kind of middle school math. What are we going to do to solve that problem? So it's very much a problem solving approach in which the, the view is, and and you take that as a position, then you really are in the continuous improvement universe. You are, you are setting yourself up to, to be scanning all the time to see what promising practices are elsewhere. If I accomplish something else in this conversation, it would be to banish the phrase best practices. If we knew what best practices were, we could quit right now and go home and just do it forever. What we've, what we've got is promising. What are the promising practices? What seems to be working? What seems to be making, making a difference and making a difference for all kids? Um, why is it that, that Union City decided, for example, if you, I don't know, if you walk into the high school in Union City, you know, in that sort of, there's a large kind of foyer. There are these cutouts and these, these medals of athletes, you know, present and past. There also are cutouts and medals for the, for the academic all-stars and for the artists and for all the rest of it. And the students' art is all over the place. Um, they have they have spent an enormous amount of energy raising the aspiration level of those kids. This is less of an issue in in Montclair, um, it, but it's still an issue. How do you how do you get everybody to believe that we are on your side? I mean, that's the we, the school system. We are on your side. We're here to help you. We're here to support you. We're not here to blame you. We're not here to. We're not here to judge you. We're not. You know, I, if if you leave school, that's our. That's a failure, as far as we're concerned. 
And so I would say everything else, including that, you know, whatever it's going to be, you know, whatever the hands-on STEM program looks like, what is the STEM is, there are great, and this is one of the things that Union Oklahoma pioneered in, they've got a pre-K to 12 STEM program that most students are taking most of the time. So it's not an elite program for some kids. And you watch what five-year-olds are able to do. It's, it's just astonishing to be reminded of the amount of talent that's there if you actually you know, invite, it to, invite it to happen. There is, there is no end to the amount of looking that you could do. And I, I can imagine if I were a, you know, a school leader in a place like Montclair saying, okay, I'm gonna ask you, Jane, you know something about early education. Go, you know, go look and see what's going on elsewhere and come back and tell us Here's what we should be thinking about. You know, Fedra, you know a lot about whatever, math, social studies, doesn't really matter, citizenship ed. I'm gonna go see what's happening elsewhere. What are people doing to, to address all the, the crazy post COVID wild kids, you know, kids issues? What are, they, what are, what are school districts doing that are, that are promising ways of addressing the trauma that your kids are feeling now? What's going on? What can we learn from other places? And all of that in the service of strengthening, making kids happy, enthusiastic, engaged, engaging. Uh, and all of that takes you, the, the, if you please, the dependent variable is graduation. But to get to graduation, you've got to address all these other questions. And you, somebody, you know, this is a, this is a task for the community to do some backward mapping to figure out what needs to be done and who's going to take care of making it happen? Jane, it may be the last question, but please. There was a, a report by the Council on Economic Opportunity, one of our um, uh, uh, very active Montclair um, donors, Josh Weston, invited me to the to this uh, forum. The the um, statistics from this group, which is was not a group of teachers. This was on the importance of pre-K. These were federal reserve chairs. These were, these were um, yeah. corporate people, um, you know, across the board. This was not a, this was not a school effort, but they were, they were finding that the, um, the, the workforce, they were not pleased with the quality of the workforce. And they, they, their conclusions are dramatic that preschool education um, raises, as you say, graduation rates, but in terms of the community, and I think we need to focus not just on schools, but of the impact on the community. There's less crime, there's more home, yeah. owner, home ownership, yeah. there is a higher rate of paying taxes, there is all sorts of benefits for the community, um, not just the schools, by offering um, preschool education. There was something in the paper today, I think, that the money that was given by the, um, the uh, Biden's first package has raised the, to mothers of young children, has raised the brain level of these children in just a year, they were able to measure that. So we, we need to think beyond school to the um, economic benefits that the community um, now it's long term. It's very hard for a town council to say in 10 years, in 12 years, we will be in much better shape. It's, that's hard politically, but the facts are there. And I think um, we need to think on a broader uh, that's, scale. Absolutely. If you think, and I just, you know, if you, if a town council should think of itself as the stewards of the future of the community. Right, right. And not as, and, and, and that's a, you know, you can, people in a, in a town like Montclair um, ought to be amenable to that kind of that kind of an argument. The data is overwhelming on all of those points. Do we know more about the benefits of early education? And I don't know if you were here when I was saying that another piece of really interesting data is just you know the the the, the famous long term study Perry Preschool showed the lifelong benefits of of an of two years of early education. Right. What's, new, what's new is that the children of the Perry preschool students are better off in these same terms mm -hmm. as the children. So if you wanna really address the whole, the, 
poverty issues, the crime issues, et cetera, in a, in a serious, sustained way. This has got to be an essential part of the story. There is, there's just no, no doubt about it. And um, this is something, this is, and you're totally, this is not just about the educators, right? This is, a, this is about the police department. Why do you have this organization of police chiefs and DAs across the country whose entire mission is pre-K. Hmm. Why? Because as I, again, they say, we don't wanna be in the business of putting 15 year olds in jail. Um, and you know, if you talk that the kind of bad behavior that teenagers can get involved in, you look at the, the, the impact of pre-K on that, um, it's extraordinary. And you look also, I wanna make one other comment about this, that is, all those powerful folks you describe are important allies, but they need to be reminded that the other benefits are the soft benefits. Um, that the kind of, what we know about social emotional development is that those kids who really have progressed by, fourth, by, by age four, they'll have done more or less as well as the kids who are really hot shots academically at that point, you look at them at age 18, they're gonna be less likely to be smoking, less likely to be drinking, less likely to be using drugs, less likely to have gotten pregnant. And that's, you know, you have a, a hard edge Nobel prize winning number crunching economist, Jim Heckman, the University of Chicago, who is, you know, the biggest band leader on this subject. And again, it's those soft, you know, it's those, the development of those soft skills as well as the academic skills that's so important. You know, we've got, we're in a politically fraught moment. I needn't, I needn't tell you that. And in terms of a long-term investment in the future of the polity as well as the, as well as the economy, I can't think of a better way to proceed. And on that notion, uh, I, am, I, I will say that um, if people want to send questions to John, um, I'd be happy to, to, to feel them and see what I can, what I can say that would, be, that would be useful. And I, I hope this has been an hour decently spent by you guys. Um, and um, it's been great to learn something about, uh, you know, a town in the state that I have written two books about and hung out for several years in. Um, so it's good, to, it's good to be back, if only virtually. I'm so glad I saw your op-ed in the New York Times Absolutely. and that you're willing to do this. And, you know, I've been reading your work for a long time. And, you know, I know about some of these things about uh, early childhood education from you. So it was really a pleasure to have you. And uh, if yes. people want to send me questions, I'll send them, I'll send them your way. Very good. Thank you. Thanks Thank again. You. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much for doing Thank that. You. My pleasure. Bye now. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Montclair folks, if you're able to stay on, uh, we can uh, spend some time reflecting on uh, the conversation and uh, what uh, Professor Kerb shared. I understand some people may have to go, but yeah. folks who, who want to stay and reflect, any um, initial thoughts or feedback uh, folks maybe we haven't heard from yet? Well, it was everything I, you know, expected basically, which was a rousing endorsement of all this research and all the various ways in which early childhood education pays off. It's not just in academic, you know, cognitive outcomes, it's in a whole spectrum of different ways. And, you know, it is one of these sorts of things that you would think would be an easy sell, even to, you know, people who are fiscally tight minded right? Or precisely to them in some sense. Uh, you know, that's not necessarily our big issue here, but uh, I guess the question really is, you know, I mean, when I hear what is said about Montclair Community